imagine for a moment that we are aliens looking down on humans at about the same scale that humans now look at ants. And it wouldn't take us long to figure out that, you know, these humans are pretty boring. They follow a trail. They stop at red, go at green. They wander around kind of aimlessly, go into buildings, sit around all day, get into another building, you know, follow a trail, go home. And at this ant scale, we would totally miss the intelligence that we have, the creativity that we have, our personalities, our different abilities in our rich emotional lives. Turns out, about 25 years ago, I left uh, my, I was, eight, I was 40, do the math, and um, bored out of my mind. And I decided I love dance. I wanted to go and look at them at the level of, uh, of a human, at a human scale. And what we find with ants is their nervous system is just as complex for their size as our nervous system is. Their brains, and yes, they have brains, are just as complex as our brains. And if we go inside the brain and look at the neurons, the neurons speak the same language that our neurons speak. They use oxytocin, serotonin, melatonin, dopamine, gabapentin, and about 95 other chemical words that run our behaviors and our emotions. And indeed, we can take a neuron from an ant brain and implant it into my brain, and it would function. And we can do the same thing, take a neuron from my brain, implant it in an ant brain, and it would function. So, in my view of ants at the human level, my first encounter was through a microscope, and I was like, holy cow, this is a fascinating society. And I met a queen, and she was laying eggs. And it, the eggs just didn't pop out. She literally was in labor, and it took a while for this egg to leave her body. And oxytocin was the neurotransmitter that was allowing her, uh, uh, that was controlling the contractions of her uterus to make these eggs um, come out. Once the eggs emerged, again, it's oxytocin that turns on our sense of love and attachment and devotion to these young, helpless offspring. And you'll notice this queen, how tenderly she carries this egg after having delivered it herself over to the clutch of eggs that she's already um, birthed. And she will guard them, protect them, and yes, love them until they hatch. And once they hatch, the uh, workers are smaller, their first batch of offspring, they're all female, they're all sterile, and they're much smaller than she is. And they pretty much take over the maternal care of their sisters. And one of the things I noticed um, in the lab was this little uh, booty waggle that these ants do. So we did with my students a whole bunch of experiments and we found that they only do this under two conditions. One, when they're taking care of their, their uh, uh, little sisters, their helpless little sisters, the eggs and the larvae, and they do it when they're ingesting a really good type of food, much like a banana split. They get really excited about it and they're just waggling those little butts all over the place. And so, in our experiments, there's no sound emitted, there's no chemical emitted, there's, it, they don't, it's not a visual signal because they live underground and light doesn't penetrate ground. And so I began to think that this booty waggling is really an expression of pleasure, the pleasure of eating and the pleasure of taking care of our young. And it's very much like the wagging of a dog's tail when that dog greets a family member. And it's very much like us smiling or rocking a baby when we greet a family member. Now, we know the fire ant as a warrior. And uh, how many of you have been stung by fire ants? 
Yeah, like the majority. And I'm sure like most of us, you are going like, man, I hate these sons of bitches. <laughs> but in fact, they're not sons. This is, they are all daughters. <laughs> They've got the weapons, the chemical weapons, the venom, and the stinger. The males do not, but that's a story for a different time. So right now, I'm going to introduce you to three ants, those that, uh, and, and they have three different personalities. They came from three different families. One of them's highly aggressive. She's like, I found somebody I don't like. The other is uh, kind of panicked and goes into, uh, plays dead, kind of goes into a fetal position. And the third one is just fearful and it's like running away. She's just in a panic and, and, and uh, can't get out. And if you watch this, you're gonna see another interaction between the aggressive ant, and there's the one in a panic, she's just taken off, and this other little ant that's younger and inexperienced just goes into the fetal position. The aggressor is seeing if she's going to move. And if she moves, she will immediately nail her with her jaws and cut off a leg, an antenna, or a head. But this little ant, and the first time we saw this, we thought it was dead. <clears throat> Pretty soon you'll see an antenna come out. She's like, is it safe to move yet? There's the antenna. And pretty soon, nothing's threatening her, because they, they work mostly by smell and by touch. And she takes off. She's ready to find an exit. So again, three very distinct personalities. The thing I've come to appreciate about ants is how much, not how different they are uh, from our world, but how similar they are. And it turns out it's a family, it's hierarchical, there is a queen, um, she is the have, she has all the resources, so it's a, it's a hierarchy of haves and have-nots. They do better in a family because they're exposed to desiccation, famine, uh, floods, um, disease. They, they, they need each other to survive. And they survive better together than if they were to face these uh, dramatic events apart. Do they all survive equally? No. But they will survive better than if they were um, solitary. I've come to think of these ants as my own family and the haves in the family, even though it, it may seem like unfair to have, you know, the, some um, that have, that are large and, uh, and fertile and have all the resources and others are sterile, small, they die young. The queen can live 45 years the um, workers live maybe a year at the most. And it seems really unfair, but here's the secret. The queens, the uh, haves, can't do without the have-nots. They need them for protection. The have-nots can't do without the resources and the goal setting of the queen. And so the big message I've gotten is that in a world beyond ourselves, no matter how big or small, no matter how rich or poor, no matter how talented or untalented, everybody counts. <laughs>